Today on the Mr. Maple Show podcast, Matt and Tim celebrate the life of mentor and friend, Dick Vandermatt. Welcome, y'all, and thanks for joining us today on the Mr. Maple Show. Today, we're going to be doing a tributary uh, podcast. We're going to be doing one in memory and a little bit of a tribute to our good friend, the late Dick Vanderbilt. Yeah, this is one that uh, we've really respected Dick Vanderbilt for years. Uh, he's been a friend of ours. He's a maple legend. Uh, he's on the he's up there in the Mount Rushmore of Japanese maples. And uh, Dick Vanderbilt uh, recently passed away. Um, good friend of ours. And, uh, we just want to do this podcast today to really talk about, you know, who Dick Vandermet was celebrate him a little bit, celebrate him a little bit and celebrate some of his plans. Yeah. This one hit me kind of hard. Uh, I got an email from his family. Uh, Dick Vandermet was one of those true legends of Japanese maples. He's one of those people that, uh, for, for our time and era was huge. I, I would say one of the sadder things about being one of the youngest guys and what we do is losing your friends. Uh, this one, Peter Gregory and Yana really hit me hard. Uh, Dick Vandermatt was always so welcoming and kind to Tim and I and encouraging. Now I'll tell a few stories about him and then we're going to get into some of our favorite introductions by him and a few of our favorite things that Dick Vandermatt's done over the years. Uh, just a cool guy. And we just want to celebrate him a little bit. We're not going to count them down this time. We're just going to talk about some of our all time classic Japanese maples that were introduced by Dick Vandermatt. And he's a guy who's had such a big impact on the industry. Uh, you'll know many of his trees, even here in the United States, Tim and I have helped popularize many. Now, the first time we actually got the privilege of meeting Dick Vandermatt was at the Maple Society meeting. Now, Tim and I have kind of told you a little bit about this trip before. Uh, this was the trip where we first got to go to Buckholtz. We, we sold all of our stuff to make this meeting happen, and we traveled uh, out to Oregon. It was in 2009 for the Maple Society meeting. Now, the special guest speaker, the keynote speaker for that meeting, was one Dick Vandermatt. Now, Dick Vandermatt had been friends with Talon Buckholtz for years. Talon Buckholtz originally sat on the planning board for this meeting that was in Tigard, Oregon, which is right outside of Portland. And uh, Talon Buckholtz had Dick Vandermatt come and really talk about some of his plant introductions and the unique way and style in which he grafts, which is very different than what many people in the United States do. And so it opened our eyes up to a lot of, you know, European selections that really weren't in the market in the United States. Got us to be, you know, we had dinner a few times with Dick Vandermatt when he was here in Tigard, Oregon. And part of the Maple Society meetings, we toured all these gardens. And so we got to know him and uh, a very friendly guy. I mean, it's, you know, he was born in May 12th, 1953. So he's only 71. Yeah, and, way too young. We we had hoped, uh, you know, we we're in constant contact with this guy. This is a friend we talk to frequently, and we'd hoped to go and visit him in 2025 when the Maple Society meeting is in Europe and make our way over to visit Dick Vandermatt. Absolutely awesome guy. We talked to him about being on the podcast a few times. He relented. He said his English wasn't good enough, but I can tell you firsthand his English was excellent. Uh, but I, I get the second language thing. It's a little tricky there. He did send us his top 10 favorite Japanese maples. Uh, he did say he was a frequent watcher of the show and just so supportive of everything we're doing. Now, that first meeting had such a big impact on Tim and I. That, that first Maple Society meeting uh, back in 2009, I remember uh, Talon Buckholtz introducing Dick Vandermatt to the group. And he said, we speak different languages. We're from different countries, but this is my brother in Maples. And I was like, what a cool... You know, they had that common bond of like, we're, we're, we're brothers in this and what an impact it had. Now, Dick Vandermatt went through and explained a little bit of his graft and style, uh, which was unique uh, for sure. He, he left a little bit of rubber band so that the light could get in. You know, some people would say they close that up so none of the light gets in. He had different techniques than what we used. The reason I went to that meeting was to learn to graft better. So part of Tim and I's accomplishment in going there was to record the grafters at Buckholtz. And, and we really really dug in with Dick Vandermatt. He was actually sitting at the same table I was sitting at and he did a hands-on demonstration of his grafting style. Um, I wish I took better pictures back then. This is my first meeting. So we weren't the best photographers back then and on old school cameras and stuff, but 
we really studied how Dick Vandermatt was grafting and we tried to learn from that and improve what we do based off what he did. And I'll tell you, it was kind of funny early on. Uh, you know, I lived in mom and dad's basement back then. So we were as small as you could be. We worked at tailgate markets and we hoped for gas money. And I would have people throw a little bit of shade sometimes. They would be like, uh, you know, I'd be back in 2009 later or in 2010. And I'd be out somewhere and someone would say, who taught you how to graft? And my answer was always Dick Vandermatt of Holland. <laughs> so that kind of hushed him up a little bit. And I was like, Dick Vandermatt of Holland. He's, he's a very famous nurseryman. He, he taught me to graft. And so that was often my answer when people were throwing a little shade my way. Like, who are you to be able to do this? Like, I, you get a little of that every now and then where, you know, so, some older guys kind of like, who are you, young whippersnapper? And what do you know about this? And where'd you learn to graft at? And that, that was always my favorite answer because they, they were like, what, what? Dick Vandermatt of Holland? How? some little redneck in North Carolina in the basement and you, you know, Dick Vandermatt of Holland. So he was always my, like, you know, my good punch back. Like I know some cool people. <laughs> now the interesting thing about his style of grafting is, you know, not only would he let the light come in, but he grafted not with a wedge like we're familiar with. I mean, we often graft down to a point on the scion, the part that's the cultivar that you're grafting onto the rootstock. He actually had more of a, you know, a square like looking wedge, which was very different and unique. It didn't come to a point. It came to a square at the end. And everyone in the United States was like, what? I've never seen that before. Why would you do that? And Dick Vandermatt's like, well, this is the way we do it and it works. And it worked for him. I yeah. Mean, it's one of those things where I always tell people when I'm teaching graft and if you get a hundred grafters in the room that are good at it, you're going to have a hundred different styles and everybody's style. You can learn something from he, he had a unique style unto him, but it worked. It was very different. It was very unique. Um, he had a very unique way of, of keeping the stock plants there in Holland, uh, you know, trim back tight because there's room as a premium. Um, one of my favorite things about Dick Vandermatt, too, since that meeting, uh, he, he just always treated Tim and I with a level of respect. We were nobody, like I said, like we're nobody now, but I mean, we were really nobody then. We were in the back. We were in the basement. You know, we had maybe three greenhouses here to our name. <laughs> like, we were super small. The other but, nurserymen were literally telling other collectors, they said, oh, who are those guys? They just sell trees out of the back of trucks. Right, right. And that's what we did. I mean, but Dick Vandermatt always treated us as, um, I'd say the next generation. He, he always said, these guys are, they're going to do something. He was always very complimentary. He was always somebody encouraging us. And we stayed in constant contact with him after that meeting. Um, whether so, it was through emails or through Facebook. I mean, we always stayed in contact with him. He told us of every grafting event. He would host these huge grafting events at his a nursery, and he would open up to the Maple Society. And he was always invited us to come, and Matt and I always are like, man, I wish I could go to his, his grafting day, where he opens his nursery up, lets people come in and, and graft, you know, and through this grafting process with him. I mean, he, he was such a fun guy. I got an email nursing. every February inviting us to that. I got a Christmas card from him. We, we started sending Christmas cards to him as well. And it just fostered this friendship, especially online. And uh, I can tell you, he was one of the most complimentary people when he heard that we had purchased Buckholtz Nursery. And he's always been somebody who championed our success here at Mr. Maple. Um, in recent years, uh, he told me that he wanted to make sure that we had most of his prominent introductions. So we did receive several of his introductions here. We'll be offering a few of those exclusively here for the first time because we're going to keep that legacy going as much as possible. And, and anything that he named that was really special I'm going to really make it a priority to get several of these new japonicums, variegated plants into production. But I was honored that he kind of reached out to us. Uh, and you kind of wonder what people know, too. I, I mean, I did, it was shocking about his passing, but he really made it a priority in recent years to make sure we had a lot of his interesting things. He really did. I mean, he would make a list of plants that he said, you, you and Matt need to be growing in North Carolina. And he would make sure that we got those plants so that we could produce them. Um, and so, I mean, he, you know, not, not even us asking for them. He would contact us and say, you guys need this guys It's grafting season. We need to send y'all these plants here. So y'all get these trees in production. And that really meant a lot to us. I mean, he looked, he, he, he respected us and, uh, it, it meant a lot to us. It's one thing that we've always had with, uh, Mr. Vandermatt is a huge level of mutual respect. And uh, he's somebody who just always treated us as we were important, even when we weren't important. That's something I'll never forget is that guy always treated us super important. And uh, he always reached out to us, too. It was super fun about that. I was going to visit him one time when the Maple Society meeting was in Holland. I've never actually gotten to go to Vandermatt Nursery. Um, I still hope to visit at some point when we're back in Europe. I've only made one trip in my life to Europe. 
Uh, after two $50 phone calls to Tim Nichols' dorm room, I found out that the cell phone I had would never work in Europe. So this is back in the BlackBerry days. I think it's probably 2011. I, I made the trip over to Belgium, and it was my first international trip. Uh, the goal was actually to uh, land and to get on a train to ride that train into the Netherlands to get off at a specific stop. And again, I speak no Dutch. And this is my first international trip at that point. And to call Dick Vandermatt, who was going to then come pick me up and I was going to spend the night at his home. Uh, unfortunately, my, my phone didn't work at all in Europe. And so I was a little fearful that I would get out somewhere and not be able to find a pay phone or be able to operate a pay phone. And at what hour of the night? So this is back before a lot of the technology we have now where you can just translate stuff. This is back before the days of really good international maps where you can just look up where you're going. And so I was a little scared that I wouldn't be able to make the connection to him. I'd, uh, I'd send him some emails. Uh, again, email used to go at snail mail pace back in those days. They weren't exactly pushing. I think I had a BlackBerry and they said, no matter what you do, this will never work in Europe, even with uh, your upgrades back then. Uh, so alas, I missed my trip to Dick Vandermatt's. I did take a trip on into Antwerp uh, where I procured a hotel last second in the middle of the night. So I found a place to stay before the meeting started. Uh, I'm going to get back over to Holland. I know Alan Tabler, uh, who's a good friend of the show and uh, former nursery manager there at uh, Don Schmidt's Nursery, huge, huge friend of ours. He recently visited Dick Vandermatt just last uh, fall and just had wonderful things to say about it. Dick was planning to retire, uh, just recently officially retired from the nursery industry, uh, but just such a big personality, such a big champion of maples. And, uh, you know, I like to say, you know, even though he was a mentor of ours, much like Buckholz did, kind of our brother in maples, because I, there's that kinship of, of people that introduce things and make contributions. You kind of get to a, well, I don't know that we're on that level yet, but you kind of get to a level of mutual respect where he definitely respected a lot of the things we were putting out there in the trade. And he wanted to continue to foster that and to help us a lot. Now, uh, I know we received this book from him at one point. You might want to talk about uh, De Collection. Um, uh, this was one of the coolest things I know, uh, when Matt and I really started amping up our cultivars, when we started getting those higher numbers of cultivars, Dick Vandermatt sent us this book and this is a custom book, uh, D E collection, Dick Vandermatt. And it's called the D E collection because that's his daughter's, uh, initials D and E. And, uh, he sent us this thing and said, to our Japanese maple friends, Tim and Matt Nickel, uh, Tim and Matt Nichols, Dick Vandermatt, and Margin Vandermatt. And we were just so honored. It was so, it's a reference book. It has several of his introductions um, at the time, and and just so much good wealth of knowledge and photography. Uh, there's so many cool ones we're going to get into. We're going to kind of highlight a little bit as we go through some of our favorite greatest hits from Dick Vandermatt. Um, but yeah, just an interesting guy and. I hope that one day I'm as good of a, a, a person to reach out to younger generations as he was to us. He was somebody who always made the effort to uh, just really let us know we were appreciated and encouraged and he always in tried the to, industry. He always tried to give us good information, too. I mean, he's introduced so many amazing selections. We can go through this uh, in a little bit on his actual introductions. But even our last, you know, he Facebook messaged us, congratulated us on the purchase of Buck Holtz Nursery. And basically said he knew it was in good hands. And then January 22nd of this year, he said, hope everything's okay. Hope grafting is going great. Uh, attached, you'll find a picture of Hino Tori Nishki left and Phoenix, the original trees. Hino Tori is more pink. The origin are, are the same. So the maples are sister slash brother. So essentially those seed came, they were sister seedlings. And then he continues on to say, you know, good luck on grafting and all, all the, of the, the same. But he was always trying to provide us with more details behind his introductions, too, which we love. I mean, how else are you going to find out that Hino Tori Nishiki and Phoenix are sister seedlings? I mean, you, you don't get those things unless you talk to the person who introduced them. And he was always giving us more information like that, which, you know, we just loved. We, we, we love that kind of information when coming from the guy who introduced it. And so it's always been somebody we've really looked up to. And um, I mean, he's got trees and many of these trees we've offered here at Mr. Maple and many of them you may have in your yard. Yeah. My, one of my last messages from Dick Vandermatt was congratulations on the takeover of Buckholz Nursery. I wish you all the best in the future. And, and most of his messages started out with how are your family? How are you doing? 
how are people? And, you know, it just means the world to us. He was invested uh, not just in Maples, but also in us. So, you know, we asked, we asked people all the time, hey, would you be interested in being on a podcast on Mr. Maple? Hey, are you interested? Would you be interested in doing a top five? We knew Dick Vandermatt probably wouldn't do a podcast because he's already said that, you know, English wasn't his best language, but he communicates with us so well in oh, English his, all the time. His English was impeccable, but I, I respect that. And I understand being a little shy in a second language. His English is certainly better than my Dutch. I have no clue how to say anything in Dutch. So, uh, uh, we respected that, but uh, we always wanted to document as much as we could from him as well. So we asked him about, you know, possibly doing a podcast, and he said, uh, "My English is not very good. I would love to, uh, I, I would love to do an interview, but I, I'm, I just don't feel confident doing that. Uh, but what I can do for you is give you my ten most favorite Japanese maples, and then you can discuss them yourselves." <laughs> yeah. And so he, when he gave us this list. He went down the list and he said, Benny Otome. Uh, he said, Dolly Hill. We were humbled by that. That was a, that was him just throwing us a bone. That's one we named after our grandmother that he has in his collection. And that was just him really being kind uh, by, you, by reference and something he knew we named. Uh, Finna. Oh, incredible. Kasagiyama. Makes a lot of sense. Nice reticulated form. Koba Sojo. A good mid-sized upright red. Muka. Mm, you don't see that one a lot of places. That's a winner. I mean, that's a small leaf selection from Japan. It's just outstanding. Um, Acer Palmeda Mila. Now, that's in my top five for sure. Acer Palmeda Sunshine. This is another one, Dick Vandermatch Introductions. It's a yellow, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty awesome. Acer Palmeda Wajima. Mm-hmm. An Acer Palmatum Zoe. Oh, man. We're going to be getting that one going, too. Kind of a Makawa form for, for, for the uninitiated there, if you hadn't seen that one yet. That's, that's kind of Dick Vandermatt's dwarf form he's introduced. Uh, incredible. Uh, again, just fun to see what his top five may have been. Uh, top ten list there. So really cool. He, he knew we liked to talk about that kind of stuff. So he was like, I'll, I'll send it to you and you guys discuss it. So we just want to throw that one out there. The second part of this podcast, we're going to get into a little bit of some of the greatest hits uh, by Dick Vandermatt. So we're going to kind of talk about some of our favorites, some things we're trying to continue on just to honor his legacy, and basically just a greatest hits list of, of what we picked that we love. So on the DE collection, uh, the Diana and the Ellen collection, as his daughters are named after, you know, when he wrote this book, you know, he had a number of collections. I think he had, was it 34? Yeah, this book actually has 34. I, I don't know the exact date of this book. I received it from him shortly after meeting him. And uh, pretty cool that he has the DE collection for Diana and Ellen, his two daughters. Pretty cool. Him and, and Marjan have such a, a cool legacy there. Uh, now, we want to get into some of our favorite hits. I'm not going to go through every one of those 34 he had in that original book. But we're going to kind of go through some of just our favorites that we're familiar with. Um, and just talk a little bit about some of the the cool trees we've seen from dick vandermatt so i'm just going to go down through from his introductions on his website uh, on the ones that i'm familiar with that i really like Uh, the first one is acer japonicum charlotte helene yeah i have some beautiful specimens of this it's starting to get more popular here in the u.s we've we certainly offered this one before um i was also wondering if this one might have been a shirasawa it's got some shirasawa like look to it really cool plant though you know we're a sucker for anything Shirasawanum or Japonicum. It's a cool plant either way. Now, Charlotte Helene is one of those trees that has one of the, a small to medium sized foliage for a Japonicum. If it's if it's really a Japonicum, it may actually be a hybrid of some sort. Maybe. I mean, you see a lot of serrated foliage on this, which makes you think that something else, another species, is getting involved in there with it. Uh, but this tree has some phenomenal fall colors, going to some yellows, oranges, and reds in the fall. It's got a nice sturdy structure, which, you know, lends to me thinking that it does have some japonicum in it. Um, but, I mean, th- it, it's a fun tree you don't see often in the nursery trade. How about for a home run hitter, Acer Palmatum and Irene? Now, I know sometimes this one's also credited as a joint introduction, but Ann Irene, sport off summer gold, as pretty as they come in the Japanese maple world. Uh, this one's been around a little while, and it's still one of our cutting-edge plants. Uh, this one can often leaf out with a pinkish-purple border, uh, to that yellowish eye, fading to more of a cream on yellow variegation. Absolutely outstanding plant. 
I've been remarkably impressed with with its ability to retain some of the heat tolerance that Summer Gold has as well. So Anarene's just been a real winner for us for durability and for wow factor. Now, the thing I really like about Anarene is it's a variegated sport, but it has a ruffled edge to it too. And that ruffled edge adds an extra ornamental appeal out there in the garden. In the springtime, when that is that orange-red color on top of the yellow main part of the leaf, I mean, it is outstanding. The contrast is outrageous on itself. And the fact that this tree has proven to be as sturdy and durable as summer gold, I mean, Anne Irene's a, a winner in my book. You know, I'm always saying pair everything with summer gold and, you know, pair it with Anne Irene. That's a variegated yellow. That's a gorgeous, you know, easy plant for people to grow. So next up, we've got Acer Palmatum Caroline. Now, I haven't got a good variegated form of this yet myself. It's kind of like rainbow in that you have to trim it for its color rather than its shape. It can revert a little bit, but it's an interesting one in that pink on red, pink on light green variegation style. I mean, this one has that scarlet rose kind of color to it. I mean, it's got that color almost like Mila on its actual foliage. It's hard to describe the color, and then you get that pink, orange, red variegation in there. And it is something you don't see on many plants. I mean, it is truly unique and special, but it is one of those types like rainbow where you really have to prune it to really, you know, it's an unstable variegated plant. You have to prune it for the variegation and not necessarily for the shape of the tree. All right. One of our other favorites here, this is one we have offered before, Acer Palmatum Dora. Now, uh, so many of these are in his family. It's fun to see uh, a legacy uh, of naming trees with your kids. Now that I've got kids too, I get that even more. Uh, but Dora, excellent introduction. It's one of those plants that gives you a nice spring orange in the early spring. I mean, the plants that leaf out in the early spring, that give you this you know, welcome of spring where the foliage itself is like a flower, where the orange color just brightens up the landscape. That's what Dora does out there in the garden. And I love that he's got so many plants named after people. Uh, I love that they're, you know, each of these plants have a story behind them and named after people. And when you're looking through the book on the DE collection book, you see a lot of the people in the photos with the plants. Right, right. So you feel like, you know, the people, you know, the plants because you know, they're right there in the photos. Another home run hitter, uh, Acer Palmatum Hino Tori Nishki. Now, this is one we've offered a lot here at Mr. Maple. We've also offered a lot at our Buckholtz Nursery. Uh, absolutely special spring interest Japanese maple. Um, Hino Tori Nishki is one of those intense spring pinks. It's one of those home run hitters that once you've seen this color, it's, it's hard to miss it. I mean, it's going to be a favorite in your collection for years to come. I mean, it is one of the most pink Japanese maples that you can get. And it does have a nice upright form. Being a sister seedling to Phoenix, um, it, it it's pretty outrageous. I mean, the colors are next level on the spring pink that Hino Tori Nishiki provides. You know, uh, we talk about this sometimes, but he, he refers to this one as having a similar form to DeSojo. DeSojo is so highly sought after for bonsai. Hino Tori Nishiki and Phoenix as well. Man, get those into your bonsai rotation. Those are some similar leaf shapes, similar... Uh, spring interest out of this world color uh, that I don't think you'll find in other bonsais. So that pink is, it, it, it is haunting. Once you see that pink, that is a pink that you will remember for forever. It is so strong. Uh, it's spring colors. You put that next to an anti rain, you've got a full garden. From one pink to another, Acer Palmatum Isabel. It's been a while since we offered this on Mr. Maple, but we'll be offering again very soon. Mm -hmm. This one for me has been more uh, shrub like on its shape. Uh, for us growing here in Western North Carolina, it's often grew a little bit wider than Hino Tori Nishiki does, where Hino Tori Nishiki has been a little more upright for me. Yeah, a little bit more of a true pink uh, on this one, where I would say the Hino Tori Nishiki is a little bit more like, I don't know, neon pink. Like this one's a little bit more of a bold pink. Uh, absolutely outstanding cultivar. Again, kind of fits into that DeSojo frame. Uh, so another great introduction there. Uh, but that spring interest is outstanding. It's consistent. It's flower-like, and uh, it's just something that makes you celebrate spring every time you see it. Now, one that's not too common in the nursery trade uh, is Acer Palmatum Katya. And I think it's pronounced Katya. I think the J is pronounced with like a, a Y kind of sound. Uh, sometimes we call it Katja. Um, but it has like a bronze color in the early spring, and then mm -hmm. sometimes that can sort of 
by late spring turned into almost like a purple tipping. Yeah, I've had that one get really nice margins uh, with kind of a greenish eye, darker green sometimes. Big leaf, kind of a unique leaf shape too. Now, Koya San, if for me, this is a winner. I mean, this one forms a nice column-like plant out in the landscape. And, you know, it, it has small foliage to it as well. And so it constantly gives a unique texture out there because of the small foliage. But the shape of this is so well and so easily used out there in the landscape and garden. Uh, Talon Buckholtz mentioned this in his, one of his blogs, uh, but talking about uh, Dick Vandermatt introductions, and talks about how Koya San is really just the perfect tree shape. And that's one of the things that makes this tree uh, so spectacular is it does have that, you know, very dense shape, but it still stays fairly narrow in its column like shape. I was really impressed with this one. One of my first experiences with a nicer specimen of this was at Buckholtz Nursery. I was visiting and I got to see some of these in some tins. I had had the cultivar before, but to see that glory of one in a full 10 gallon, you know, nice looking specimen. I loved how dense and full and columnar it was from the base all the way to the top. Uh, it's got a lot of what people like about Sukasa Silhouette. It's got a lot of what people like about something uh, more dwarf and compact, Makawa-ish like. It's got that density to it. Reminds me a little bit of something between Teruyama and Sukasa Silhouette. If those two had a baby, Koyasan might be right there. It kind of has that, that that appeal of both, though. And I, Pinkest bronze flushes on that one. It's, it's pretty, pretty next level for a plant. Now, uh, I'm going to mention the next one because it's one of my top fives. I, you know, he mentioned one of ours would be in his top fives. I couldn't do a top five without putting Mila in it. Mila would probably be my favorite introduction from Dick Vandermatt. If not, it's it's pretty close to the top. I think Mila's so next level. It's so everything I want in a Japanese maple. And I uh, absolutely love it. We've helped popularize this one in America. It was one of the first ones Dick got to us. We we're probably the first ones in America to actually have this one from him. Uh, but it just continued to win in every single season. And it gave me, uh, you know, a more appreciation for Dick Vandermatt's introductions. I think when I saw this one, it was like, wow, that's really next level. And you started to see all the subtleties to why this one was a winner. I'll tell you, when Dick gave his introductions at, you know, his uh, presentation at the Maple Society meeting, we often were looking at foliage. And many of the trees in his collection that he's grafting off of are stock sinwood plants. So and they that's get cut back pretty heavy. They get cut back really heavy, and so you can't really appreciate the form. And the colors aren't always the photo of at its, at its you know, the best time of the year. And when you grow these plants and you start to appreciate them, I mean, you start to realize a lot of these introductions are next level. I mean, Mila, to me, is, like Matt said, it's one of my favorite of his introductions. The colors are outrageous. It's hard to describe the the pink orange red colors that are kind of metallic y and sh- glossy. And it's a tree that's not only beautiful in the spring, but the new flushes of growth there in the summer are some of the most attractive of any of the Japanese maples in the summer. And so it gives you that additional interest later on in the summer when a lot of the plants, you know, aren't at their peak. Mila is almost always at its peak. And having a big a specimen this specimen of this at Maplewood Gardens, I fell in love with this, and I think it's always going to be a tree that we try to produce in big numbers. Uh, the whole nursery industry can thank Dick Vanderrat for that one. It's one that just, it's a beauty, and it keeps on just performing every single season. Another all-time classic here, a dwarf with some seca growth to it. I mean, it's got that dense weirdness going on. Looks really cool out of leaf even. Acer palmatum Miss Piggy. Yeah, that tree is wild. I mean, what... what what a great name for this tree, too. How it twists like little pigtails on the end. Uh, it looks almost cactus-like at times out of foliage. I it's out of leaf when there's no foliage on the plant. I mean, this tree is interesting whether the leaves are on it or, with, or whether they are not. And it is outrageous on the way this tree grows. Yeah, Dick actually said the original, you know, the reason it got that name is it had growth near the base branches that were swirling like pigtails. So it kind of had that pigtail swirling off of it. Uh, irregular growth, irregular curves to it, kind of breaks all the rules for acers. Typically, acers have de- uh, you know alternating buds. This one throws buds on every single place, so it, it it's a weird, unique plant. Still get that palmatum foliage. I found Miss Piggy to be tough as nails and a little faster growing than Seki Yatsubusa as well. We've got a gorgeous one of these a specimen of this on our bank here at Mister Maple, and for me, it's just outrageous. You check this tree out during the winter. 
the way this tree twists and curves, it's something that you're going to want to have in the garden. So next up, we've got Acer Palmatum Momiro Koyosan. I don't know if I say that correctly, but this is a spring, like pink white in the early spring. It's that lighter shade of pink out there in the garden. Yeah, Memorio. I don't know. I've always I've always tried to say it the best I can. I have no idea either. Beautiful plant. Um, one that's just striking for its kind of flaked variegation style. You can get some real interesting flaking on this one. Kind of gives it a little bit of uh, almost Ukigumo-like vibes to it sometimes. Beautiful plant. Um, he describes it as a kaleidoscope of changing colors, which I think is a beautiful way to talk about this one. Um, this one does fill out pretty quickly, though. Typically, uh, you know, a six-footer, even in 10 years, um, right in that mid-size range, six to eight foot. Multi-stem tends to be part of the approach to this one, and just some really good color changes. I mean, that, that pink is really nice, but that kind of speckling throughout it even gives it a little something extra. And that multi-branch approach that Memorial Koyasan brings gives this tree more of a shrub shape out there in the landscape. So it gives you some of that spring flowering interest on more, a more of a shrub like tree. One, I don't even think we had marked here. What we actually do, we'll go back to it, but uh, Peter's choice, you know, one he named for Peter Gregory uh, before Peter passed. Uh, I know those two were friends and, and it had a lot of mutual respect for each other, but cool to see him honoring the late great Peter Gregory, who was a huge friend of ours as well. Now the story goes that Peter was visiting his nursery and was walking around through his seedlings and said, oh, I really like that one there. And that's how it got became Peter's Choice, because Peter said, you know, he liked it. So it became Peter's Choice. The story the was that trade. Peter came back later and was like, what's this Peter's Choice? And, and Dick Vandermatt said, you picked it. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he said, that one was yours, buddy. You, you told me that was your favorite. Uh, super cool, though. Uh, one we're going to be offering at some point here at Mr. Maple, and I think is a super next level tree, is Acer Palmatum Olivia. You Do you want to talk to him about that? All right. That's pretty top secret, but it's pretty special. Now, that is a more dwarf uh, version of Acer Palmatum Ukigumo. I mean, it's shorter, slower growing, and it still gives you those white colors that you get with the floating clouds maple. Yeah, that one's going to be super next level. It tends to be a little bit more ball shaped and dense in its overall habit to it. Uh, one of the newer introductions by Dick Vandermatt, one that uh, we felt really special that Dick kind of contacted us and said, I, I want this one to live on with you guys. And he kind of said, I'm retiring. So you need some of these trees in your collection, whether they're uh, mass produced or not. I want you to have this so that you can, you can see what it is. Now, Olivia is also known under the name Olivia Marjani, uh, which I've seen it under as well. Um, you know, still an amazing plant, whichever name is becomes the official name on. I think Olivia is the one that he's going with. Uh, but I mean, that plant it, it's next level. I mean, I wasn't sure we were going to talk about it in the podcast today because it, it kind of is that next level plant. That's well, top secret information going out there to you guys. But hey, you're tuning in for a, a really cool podcast on our good friend here. Now, here's another one. Uh, you know, if you're doing Hall of Fame trees, uh, here's another one you kind of put in his greatest hits. But Acer Palmatum Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. That one really just it. The colors on it are is that that pink orange kind of color. That mm. coral kind of color, a coral pink that just grabs your attention. I mean, I fell in love with this plant the very first time I saw it in the spring. And ever since then, I've it's been a plant that I've you know, always loved because of how intense those spring colors can be. That pink's excellent. You get some of that flaking on it sometimes, fades to a green. And when it does, you get some new growths that are incredibly pink too. So you get kind of a phoenix rising from the green there. You get some color contrast within this plant itself in the summer. Uh, you get great fall colors on it as well. But that spring color of pink is really special, especially in the early spring. I mean, spring for maple people is already a phoenix. It's the rising of colors. You've waited all winter. And then this one splashes onto the spring. It's like next level pink. Typically around 8 to 10 foot, even in 10 years. This one's a pretty vigorous grower. I think that's why it might be one of his more popular introductions for the trade. A lot of people pick this one up. It's, it's kind of hit the American trade and gotten very popular. I would say you see this one more and more now. Uh, you know, all over the U.S. Just because one people could say it, probably it's got a it's got an easy name that's easy to uh, easy to visualize what it is with a phoenix. But it's an absolutely outstanding plant as well. Now, one of his introductions that we need to get back in production better, and I started trying to get it back in the production cycle, is Acer Palmatum Sandra. Uh, that is a gorgeous pink, six foot in ten years, upright, stays fairly dense in its nature. So it really is more of a dwarf a selection, but Sandra, that one is 
next level. And, you know, there are so many amazing plants and it's one that I've got to make a top priority to get it back in production more and more. I know we've grafted some in the last few years, so hopefully we'll be having some of Sandra coming available in the, in the next few years on Mr. Maple. One of his most well-known sports, or one most well-known trees as a sport, uh, Acer Palmatum Taylor. Now, uh, absolutely beautiful tree. It uh, does have a little bit of durability issues here in the deep south for our cold. Sometimes it doesn't shut down too well for our colder climates, but maybe one of his most popular for the colors. There's a reason why everybody continues to grow this one. It's so next level. Uh, Dick Vanderman actually named this one after one of his nieces who lives here in the United States. Sometimes in our Facebook group, Mr. Maple Friends, her mother will even post in there. She's uh, quite the avid maple person as well. Uh, very cool to see that legacy living on. Um, Taylor, uh, you know, if you can get the right conditions, it tends to be a little bit more of a, a greenhouse plant. So I always do let people know that it looks its best typically in our greenhouses. I've had more problems with it in the ground, but the colors are so next level. I mean, a lot of people put this in their top fives just because it is, it is like, it's like Photoshop dream. It's, it's insane for the colors. Well, I know in the Pacific Northwest, it's very popular. And I know that this is a plant that seems to perform very well in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why it has a PBR and that's a European version of a patent. And it is next level because there's nothing else that gets quite as pink as Taylor does. And it is a next level plant. I just wish that it was uh, a little more durable for the South because I think a lot of our issues come in with it shutting down our, our colder winters seem to kind of give it some issues of staying active. Um, it was found as a sport on butterfly. So you get this incredible color pattern of more intense pinks, kind of creamy mints late summer. Um, it's, it's a showstopper of a tree. It's a fun one amongst collectors. Cause it's kind of fun to brag about who has the biggest tailor. It is a tricky one though. It always let people know when, when trees are a little harder to grow. Uh, this one can be fairly near, fairly narrow in its growth, but also fairly tricky, uh, for people to perfect this one in the garden. Uh, doesn't stop people from trying. It's one's highly sought after. It's one that people are always after for us. Uh, you know, he even describes it as needing a little more tender love and care. So you got to watch out with that one, especially in some of the hotter climates and uh, some of the places that get uh, changing weather in the winters can kind of give it some issues. But again, doesn't take anything away from that color pattern. The thing is nuts. It's crazy. Now, Tess, this is a selection that's more narrow and upright. It's got a little bit of coral pink to the new growth and it goes yellowish to oranges in the fall. Uh, for me, it is an awesome plant. There aren't many narrow, upright Japanese maples that give you that green color, the Sukasa silhouette. Uh, but Tess gives you that same kind of shape, um, but gives you a different fall color and something that's got a little bit different foliage as well. Yeah, nice spring pinks to it. Uh, just great new growth. The new growth can actually flush a lot of pink too on the green. Um, fairly narrow in its habit, like Tim was saying, more of a, a fastidiate plant than a truly columnar plant, but a very attractive overall shape to it. And a good grower, typically over a foot of growth a year on that one. We've offered Tess a few times here at our nursery. Uh, and a lot of cute children in this book too. I mean, I'm, I got, I got two little girls and a little guy now, so it's always fun to see some of the, the families and sp these kids have all grown up now. So it's, it's fun to see so many new introductions by him too. Uh, he, he was really gracious to make sure we got a lot of these. Uh, a lot of these are new to us, so we don't have a ton of experience with them, but I, I can tell you that I, I will be producing as many of, uh, of these really next level ones as possible. We'll be getting them out in production, getting them, uh, to Buckholtz nursery, getting them in production there, getting them in production here. And I, I know one of the plants that you, whenever you have, try to grow a plant and then, you know, you fail at it, that quickly becomes the plant that you have to have. <laughs> right. Like when we, those we tried, don't take, you got to go back. We tried grafting Acer Palmatum Zoe mm. and then it didn't take. And I have a niece named Zoe. So that's a special one for me. I've, I've been trying for forever to get Zoe. Uh, that one is... Kind of Makawa like. It's a dwarf for sure. It's kind of got, like Goshiki Kotahime like, but then kind of Makawa. I mean, it's. it's I don't know different. what category I would put that one in. It's definitely going to be a dwarf green that everybody that does collect Makawas is going to want because it's a really nice next level dwarf green. Um, I'm just so glad now we have that tree in production here at Mr. Maple because I know years ago we tried grafting it and we were unsuccessful. And, you know, when you graft something and then it doesn't take it hurts your heart right. and you have to find that plant. And to me, Zoe is that plant that got away and now we've got it. So I'm darn happy about it. And this one will be producing a bunch. It has this kind of, kind of yellow pink kind of color in the spring. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's a dwarf that everyone's going to love. 
I mean, it, it does stand out. It's very different. There's so many of these new ones that are next level, and it's going to be new experiences with us, kind of learning about these, documenting them. Terza is a new one I know that really stood out to us. I like the bronzing it kind of showed. Uh, you know, fairly new to me, so I don't know a ton about that one, but the color patterns to it seem like it may be complementary of Mila, you know, and its color patterns too, something that would kind of pair well really nicely with that. Now, one that's a really unique one from him is uh, Acer Seboldianum Ingolstadt. That one's like a Matt Samuri Seboldianum. Right, I mean, it's, weird stuff. It's kind of got some red color to it, so it's bringing something different into the Seboldianum that I've never seen before. I know we've had some people pick that one up at open houses here. I don't know if we've listed it on Mr. Maple in a long time. A lot of these we listed back, I mean, long, long time ago. Some of these are on Mr. Maple. Some Dick Bannerman introductions were on Mr. Maple that haven't been updated since we got onto our new platform. And I mean, some of his introductions made us popular and had our, you know, they were kind of our new striking thing in like 2013, 2012. What about Ukeisha? Ukeisha. I, yeah, that one's, I don't know how you say that. Everybody jokes here. They're like, Ukeisha. Like they don't know what that one's about, but it is, it is about some fall color. That one is one of my favorite plants. I've got a nice one of those planted in a display garden. It's probably eight foot now. Uh, we believe it to be uh, Acer Seaboldianum. Yeah, it very much could be an Acer Seboldianum. It could be a Cirrusolinum X Seboldianum. Right. I mean, it's got that that larger foliage. It's got some of that pubescence that you get on Seboldianum. But the fall colors are outrageous on it. And it has a really nice upright form. It is beautiful. I've been just blown away by it. Um, some really cool new ones. Uh, Luna. <laughs> yeah. Luna means moon. It's a full moon Japanese maple. An Acer Cirrusolinum. Nice rounded foliage to it. I mean, perfect name for a full moon Japanese maple. Uh, Dick was very uh, influential in japonicums. So there's a lot of different interesting japonicums. Uh, I couldn't tell you much about these, but I know we'll be working to produce Acer Japonicum David, Acer Japonicum Thomas, and Acer Japonicum DE Collection. Now, uh, we'll talk to the family, but that may be a good candidate that, that Dick didn't put a name on to put Dick Vandermatt on. He didn't put his own name on anything. Uh, maybe we can honor him with something there. Terza and Jessica are also just ones that have blown me away. Uh, they're just starting to leaf out here in some of our, our one gallons and graft houses. What about Acer Palmetto and Finna? Oh my gosh, there's so many next level plants. F- like Finna has this just real thread like foliage on it. It is almost fairy hair esque on its foliage. And uh, one in the DE collection that we'll be producing here at Mr. Maple. I mean, his collection is next level. Dick Vandermatt's one of the few people in the world. There's large collections of maples that uh, that are just outstanding. There's Yano-san, who had a huge collection. There's Guy Malo. There's Esfeld Nursery, Dick Vandermatt. And there's not as many people who have, you know, a thousand cultivars of Japanese maples. Right. We and, were chasing him when we started out. We're like... Dick Vandermatt's got a thousand cultivars of Japanese maples. We got We got to get on that level. So it was one of those guys that we always looked up to for his introductions, but also his collection of trees was so next level. Uh, he was somebody who championed maples, and uh, he had the addiction like we had the addiction. Like he he had to have new stuff and cool things, and it's so fun to see, um, you know, and just have that kinship with someone. It's it's funny how much the world gets small when you're into Japanese maples. I've got friends all over the planet. And I think that's really where our friendship and kinship really started was him ooing and aahing at some of the maples that we had here in America that he didn't have and us ooing and aahing with the maples that he had in Europe that we didn't have and just, you know, sharing and being friends and enjoying Japanese maples. And that's really what the maple world is all about. It's about uh, sharing your love and passion of Japanese maples with each other. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's got such great introductions. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why he found so many cool plants is because he had so many different varieties to compare them against that he could introduce something that was different than what was already out there in the nursery trade. Uh, Such a cool guy. Somebody I'll always admire. I know just weeks even before his passing, he was sending invitations to us through Buckholtz Nursery uh, to the whole team. Like, you guys got to get over here and visit. Somebody who invited me to visit so many times and uh, just a legacy that won't be forgotten in Japanese maples. He's definitely on that Mount Rushmore for, for my career of people and uh, just somebody that I, I really appreciate all his encouragement to us here at Mr. Maple. He's somebody who's always kind of fostering our growth um, just by just by his continued encouragement, something that gives somebody like us hope. We're sitting here in the basement 
And it's like, well, Dick Vandermatt thinks I'm pretty cool. Like, maybe maybe I will make it, you know? Uh, so it was always one of those things where it was a, a bit of a confidence boost for us and, and a guy that just kind of had our back and supported us and uh, had nice things to say about us even early on. So we'll, we'll be thinking fondly of Dick. We'll be praying for the family. Um, he'll be greatly missed in the Japanese maple world. But, uh, you know, it's kind of fun. It It's bittersweet, but it is fun. Uh, you know, we lose so many greats. Like I mentioned, Yano and Peter Gregory. But it's beautiful to see some of his trees and, and his collection live on. And when I see trees that Dick Vandermatt named, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit of a memory and a feeling about uh, times you'd shared. So it's it, something that can live on. It's, it's fun. Nurshermen live on sometimes through their collections, and their introductions. Well, thanks so much for jumping in today. Uh, if you hadn't subscribed to us on your favorite podcast platform, please do so. Give us a five-star rating. It helps more people find us. Thank you all so much. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.